appreciate you being here today, being in your place. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. There's a lot of other places we could be, but I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be. Amen. Right now, I might rather be in my office where my page full of notes are that I was looking for. Oh, well, there wasn't too much left on there. I remembered that, but uh, it's been one of those mornings. I was sitting there about halfway through the singing, and I was thinking, something's missing here. Then I realized it was my coat. I'd left it in my office, so I went back and got it and still didn't have everything I meant to come out with. That's just the way it's been for the last few weeks, so uh, uh, just bear with us as best you can. It is good to be here today. Before we get in the message, I just I want to say one thing that Brother Benny uh, had told me about last week that I'll be honest, I didn't realize. I made mention this Wednesday night, but I didn't realize, and that is that uh, early voting is now in progress, so uh, you can go and early vote in the primaries now. I did last week. Uh, I would encourage you to do so. I would encourage you, however, to be more prepared than I was uh, when I went and, uh, and to do a little more research than what I got done as far as the down positions uh, that are up for election uh, this November in the primaries right now. And uh, if I didn't know, uh, I didn't vote for that particular thing because I'm not going to put down the wrong person. So I'd encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to go and, uh, and vote in the primary. I told them Wednesday night, I didn't realize there were uh, actually three people on the primary ticket to run for president on the Republican side. And so there are things to vote for, uh, and I would encourage you to do so. The good thing is the primary vote, you don't have to wait in line. I walked straight in there. There was not one person in line. I had the whole place to myself like I owned the place. Walked right in there, unlike this morning, had everything I intended to carry in with me and uh, did what I was supposed to do. So if you get a chance, you can do that. Turn with me to the book of the Revelation, <clears throat> chapter number 4. Preached along these lines before, uh, maybe not too long ago, but uh, much to some things that have been said this morning. When everything is great in your life and you're on the mountaintop, sometimes we tend just to be content with the status quo. Uh, we're very happy with the way things are. We see no need for change. We look for no change. We don't desire any change. And then when adversity of any kind hits your life, whatever that may be, uh, regardless of what it is, then you begin to think about other things. Well, that's sort of the way it's been with me for about the last uh, several weeks, a lot going on. And, and I'm not saying that by ways of complaining about anything. That's not the point. I'm just saying is it, it changes your focus. And I couldn't tell you the number of times that in my mind and across my lips, I've said, even so come, Lord Jesus. You simply get tired of fighting. And I find that it's during those times that we tend to be drawn closer to the Lord. And we tend to look for Him. We tend to look for His presence. Uh, we seek His presence more. We desire His presence more uh, through prayer and other, uh, and other means. And so I've thought about that, and I've thought to myself, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen? Uh, Revelation chapter number uh, uh, 22 and verse 20, I believe. That's not where we're going. We're going chapter 4. But that's where it says, even so come Lord Jesus. Uh, I'm ready for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've made reference to that as late several different times in different messages. But today I'm going to preach on that thought. And, and you know, for a child of God, I know many people... Many children of God, many Christians, uh, when you mention the book of the Revelation, they get excited. Uh, we tend to get excited. We like to hear teaching and preaching from the book of the Revelation. Uh, and that's all great. Uh, and we need to preach and teach that to the church, to the people of God. Uh, but when we're talking to the world and we're preaching to the world and to lost people, we need to back up there to the salvation uh, that is given to you and I in the books of the gospel and other places. Uh, but we need to talk to them about salvation. A uh, number of times I have in my past especially led people to the Lord or come in contact with someone that is a new Christian. And the first thing they'll say is, I want to read the book of the Revelation. And I would encourage them not to do so. 
And I've told them that. What you need to do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You need to understand the Gospels. You need to understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is, exactly what he did for you, and who you are now, and what he expects of you. And in time, you can get to the book of the Revelation. If you read the book of the Revelation right off the beginning, you're going to get discouraged. You're not going to understand it. And therefore, you're going to get discouraged and fall by the wayside. Uh, the church that I'm speaking to today, our church here, and any child of God that may be listening, uh, we've been saved by the grace of God. If we've got anybody that's lost here today, uh, I would love to take the Word of God and show you what it says about salvation. Today I'm preaching a message that will help you as well as the church. And the church, we're supposed to understand it. We're supposed to get into the meat of the Word of God. We're not supposed to just be nibbling around the fringes. We're supposed to understand uh, the doctrinal principles of the Word of God. The dispensations that are mentioned in the Word of God. And they will help you and I to grow closer to the Lord. Now several years ago, and I don't remember how many years, I could have looked it up. Uh, we did an extensive study, verse by verse, through the book of the Revelation. It may do that again someday. Uh, I don't know. We did that on uh, Sunday nights, and I think we took the better part of two years or two plus years to do that. Uh, and it was uh, encouraging. Uh, it, was, uh, it was worth our time. It taught us things, helped us to understand things. But I've also noticed this as pastor in a church. And when I say this, I'm not saying I'm any different than you are. But over time, we tend to forget the things that we've learned. And we have to be reminded over again. <clears throat> the book of the Revelation basically divides in three parts. And I'll probably talk more about that in a few moments. But I'm going to go ahead and read that now anyway, since it comes to my mind. In the first chapter of the book of the Revelation, in verse number 19, we have laid out here for us an outline of the book of the Revelation. The Bible said, write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's what the book of the Revelation covers. The things in, verse, in chapter number 1 that are in the past, the things in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that are in the present where you and I live in the church age, and then as the Bible says here, and the things which shall be hereafter, which begin in chapter 4 and go through the end of the book. I want to spend my time today on one verse, and that's chapter 4, verse number 1. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've, got, we've gone past chapter 1 in the past. We've, look, we've gone past the church age in chapter 2 and, church, and, and chapter number 3, which is where we live now under the dispensation of grace. You and I live in the age of the church. The New Testament church, that age will continue until God comes back for the church. That's what I want to talk about. Even so come Lord Jesus. When I pray that prayer, when I utter those words, uh, and you do, what we are saying is, uh, Lord, I'm listening for the shout. Lord, I'm waiting on the shout. I'm waiting on the call when you'll step out on a cloud with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and you'll shout with that voice and call your children home what you and I refer to as the rapture of the church. That's what I want to talk about for a little bit this morning. I want you to understand something here about chapter 4 and verse number 1. Let me get back there. This is a very, very important verse. It is a very unique verse. It is a very special verse. And the fact is that if we, let me go so far as to say this. If we fail to understand chapter 4 and verse number 1, if we get it wrong and fail to understand what it is telling us, uh, then we'll be off for the remainder of the entire book of the Revelation. We will not be able to understand the things that are occurring in chapter 6 forward if we don't understand what occurs in chapter 4, verse number 1. It is that important. That's what I want to try to help us to do today. I want to try to take this verse and break it down and see what it is saying to you and I as the people of God. 
<coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So we want to back up and see this, uh, this particular verse in chapter number 4. It is very vital. If you don't start right, you can't end right. If you start building a house, and you get the foundation off, and you start in the first corner, and it's out of square, the rest of the house is going to be out of square, right? How many of you may happen to you this morning? Didn't me, that's not why I'm saying it, but it could very well happen. You begin to get dressed for church, and you go and you get your shirt out of the closet, and you put your shirt on, and you begin to button it, and you button it, I button from the bottom up. Actually, I normally start in the middle, if you want me to know the truth. I start in the middle and go down and come back. And go, I don't know why. I don't know why. Those are things you don't need to know. <laughs> but if you start buttoning that shirt up and you get up here to the collar and you look and one side's about three inches taller than the other, you realize you started wrong. And you got the first button in the wrong buttonhole and the whole shirt's out of whack and you didn't start right, so you can't finish right. That's the same principle here. If we don't start and understand chapter 4, verse number 1, and what God tells us and what it means for you and I, then we're going to end wrong. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 are some of my favorite chapters in the Word of God. Because it is in those two chapters, and you go home and read them both. It is in those two chapters uh, that we'll find out what the church, where the church is. Thank you very much where you and I will be, and what you and I will be doing when we're raptured out of this world. You find that out in chapters 4 and chapter 5. Chapter 6 through chapter about 19 deals with things that are occurring on the earth during the time that we call the Great Tribulation. That will follow the rapture of the church. So with all that said, I want you and I to understand that right now we're living in the third chapter. The second and third chapter, we're living in the church age. We are looking for what is going to occur in chapter 4, verse number 1. We're looking for the rapture of the church, and I'll talk more about that as we go. So we're talking now from this point forward, we're dealing with future events. Something that's going to occur in the future, not something that has occurred. There would be those uh, that would teach and tell you uh, that it's already occurred. They would be biblically wrong. I can say that because that's not what the Word of God teaches. I'm going to explain to you, hopefully in detail, as I preach on this thought. One of these days, very soon, I believe, we're out of here. We're going to leave this world behind. We're going to leave our jobs behind. We're going to leave our mortgages behind. We're going to leave our homes behind. We're going to leave the world behind. We're going to leave everything that we know here behind and go to a new place. I'm going to talk about that this morning if I can. Stay with me. I'll do my very best to be uh, respectful of your time. The first thing I want to see is that if we break this verse down, the first thing I want you to see is the magnitude of this verse. Number one, it's a transitional verse. What do I mean? Look at chapter 4, verse number 1, and then we're going to pray. I'm going to read the entire thing, and then I'll begin to break it down. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Let's pray. Father, I am so very thankful, Lord, that we have a day coming, that we're going to leave this world, that you're going to call for your children, all those that have been born again, all those that have trusted you as their Lord and Savior, will go home to be with you for all of eternity. Lord, we look for that day. Uh, we pray for that day. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, as we began to look at this verse and break it down ver uh, word by word, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, our minds, and our souls. I pray that you'd excite something within us, Lord, that we'd be excited to go home. But not just that, Lord, but we'd be excited to take as many with us as we possibly can. That we'd leave this sanctuary today with a zeal to tell others that you're coming again and tell others how to be saved. Father, bless your church. Bless the reading of your word. And may you receive honor and glory as you're the only one worthy. In Jesus' name, 
amen and amen. So we see this verse as a transitional verse. What do I mean? I want you to notice about three words here. The first two and the last word. The Bible said in chapter 4 verse 1, after this. The last word in chapter 4 verse 1 is hereafter. So what the Apostle John here is telling you and I, John the Revelator, what he is telling you and I is uh, that we have just crossed over uh, when he says after this. It means after what? After chapter 2? After chapter 3? After the church age? After this, now he's going to tell us what's about to occur. The church age, when it comes to an end, what is going to occur? And then he goes on to say in the last, ver- last word of that verse, that he'll show thee, show thee things which must be hereafter. After what? After the church age? After the church is gone? Then what will occur uh, in the Bible? What will occur on the earth? And what is held in the future uh, for the church and the world? And so we see a great span covered right there. And this is a transitional verse. In other words, it carries from one dispensation to the next something has to occur something has to happen after it does then this is going to happen that's where we're at we've not made it to chapter 4 verse 1 yet we're still living in chapter number 3 2 and 3 in the church age but I do believe those things are coming I read went back and read to you chapter 1 in verse number 19 which gives us the outline but I'm going to go back over that real quick because I want you to understand I'm trying to give you a, a synopsis of the whole book here In chapter 1, it says here, the things which thou hast seen. So that points to events in chapter number 1. Then John said, the things which are. This points to chapter 2 and chapter 3, talking about the letters to the seven churches. Much we can learn in those letters. I'll refer to those here, some of those here in just a moment. But then, uh, and understand it, that chapters 2 and 3, they cover the entire church age. We know when that started. On the day of Pentecost. The church was born. The church came into existence. So chapter 2 and chapter 3 cover a period of time from the apostles on the day of Pentecost up until the period of time that the Lord Jesus Christ will come and call his church home. That's the dispensation of grace. That's the dispensation of the church. Now, then he says these things which shall be hereafter. Well, that points to all the things that will happen when the age of the church is ended or the dispensation of grace is over. Now understand this, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, which are two of my favorite chapters, what we find there are the redeemed saints of God in heaven. We find them in the presence of the Holy God. We find them worshiping the Lord there in heaven. That's where we find it. That is important, church. Chapter 6 through chapter 19, they deal with the tribulation period and the wrath of God as he judges this world for its ungodly acts, for what it did to his son, for the sin, as he purifies his people, the nation of Israel, all from chapter 6 forward. But chapters 4 and chapters 5 are are very important uh, parts here as we do find the church. Because understand, after those two chapters, 4 and 5, there is never, listen to this, There is never a mention of the church on the earth throughout the rest of the book. The church has been taken from the earth in chapter 4, verse number 1. This is a very, very significant verse here. Let me move on. I've got to for the sake of time. We also see that it's a picture verse here. In other words, uh, we just see one man here. John says, after this, I look, him. He said, and behold, a door which was opened to heaven, the first voice which I heard was it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this verse is dealing with one man, John. I have made this statement to you in times past, and I'll make it to you again today for those that have not heard it. If you want to understand where the church is, what the church is seeing, what the church is going through when it comes to the book of the Revelation, then you need to find John and you need to stay with John. Wherever John is, that's where the church is. Amen? So here we find John in chapter number 4, verse number 1 here, as he says, I heard a voice. But John here, you must understand, 
is a representation of something else. In other words, it's greater than John. We're talking about the church, amen. We're talking about you and I, born-again believers, all the way from the apostles, all the way to now, whoever gets born again today, right now, up until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the church. The church. So we're talking about the rapture of the church. That's what we call it, the rapture of the church. I'll deal with that word in a moment. When this event takes place, there's several things that are going to be set in motion. Uh, It'll be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll think of it in a moment. I can't even think. But it'll be one event that triggers many more. And when it occurs, the bride of Christ is going to be taken out of this world. The Bible tells that in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. We call this rapture in the word of God, the blessed hope in Titus 2, 13. Aren't you glad we have that hope? Aren't you glad that what we're going through today is not the end of it? Aren't you glad we have something better to live for than what we fight and go through every day? And that it doesn't end at the grave, but we have a hope that lies beyond the grave. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. That ought to excite somebody other than me. Amen. It excites me, and I'm hard to get excited sometimes. We also see, not only will the church be taken out of the world, but the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God, will be taken out of the world. The Holy Ghost of God came to this world on the day of Pentecost. He came in with the church. He stayed with the church, and he'll leave with the church. Amen. All this will occur at the rapture of the church. Not only that, this sinful world we live in, this rebellious world that we lived in, at that point in time, the church is gone, the Holy Ghost is gone, the the world as we know it will be plunged into what we call the Great Tribulation. They're about to experience the wrath of God such as never been poured out upon the face of the earth before. They're going to experience things that are, are too horrible for you and I to even imagine. So before I go any further, I would ask you this simple question. Are you ready? Are you ready for the rapture of the church? And to be ready, you must be saved by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. So let me move on about chapter 4, verse 1. This this chapter, this verse rather, is a very visual verse. What do I mean? I mean that this book, in fact, the entire book of the Revelation is filled full of signs and and symbols and illustrations uh, that God gives us uh, so that this book can be understood by countless ages of people uh, that we can understand the signs that he's given us. And let me go on to say this, that just because God uses signs and symbols and illustrations uh, doesn't make it any less truth or any less likely to happen. I'm promising you that every word in the book all the way through and in the book of the Revelation will be fulfilled just as it's written. Amen? Uh, It will be fulfilled. In fact, if we were to go back, and I'll flip back, but to the very first verse in the book of the Revelation, the Bible says this in chapter 1, verse 1. Is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now listen. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now that word signified. If you break that word down and take out the first four words, we see sign. And then we see the letter I, and then we see fide on the end. So it just tells you and I that God is going to use signs and types and symbols and illustrations throughout the Word of God. Example, the Lord Jesus Christ is pictured as a lamb. The Antichrist is pictured as a beast. The church, the redeemed people of God are pictured as the four and twenty elders. So God uses all these different signs and types and symbols and analogies to show you and I what is going to come to pass. Uh, Do not think for a moment, because God does that, uh, that it makes it any less important or that it will not occur as it says. God simply put it in a manner that people from the apostles' day to our day and beyond could understand what he's trying to tell us that's going to happen. If we don't understand 
How could we flee from the wrath that is to come? So he used a bunch of symbolism there. Let me move on. Here I want you to see two symbols given to us in this verse. And they're given to us to encourage us here. John says, after this I looked, (coughs) and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The phrase that is used there uh, literally means there was a door standing open. That means it's open, it's not shutting. It is standing open in heaven. Now, if you were to go with me, and I'll take just a moment, uh, but the word door is used four times in the book of the Revelation in three verses. This is the third and last time that is used. I want you to understand this. In the book of the Revelation, chapter 3, verse number 8, in the church age, the Bible says this. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. An open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So here in chapter 3, verse 8, in the church of Philadelphia, we see the door is open to service. What that is telling you and I is, if we are a New Testament church that loves the Lord, serves the Lord, and we are in His will, there is an open door before our church to serve God that no man can shut. We have the ability, we have the means, and we have the authority from God to conduct heaven's business on earth. The door of service has been opened to you and I. In the book of the Revelation chapter 3 in the church age in verse number 20. We see here dealing with the church of Laodicea. The Bible said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now we see the door of salvation. And that door of salvation is still open today for any lost people that would give their heart, their mind, their soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, would turn to Him, confess their sins, accept Him as their Savior, uh, they can receive that door. He stands at the door of their heart and knocks begging to come in if they'll just open the door and let Him in. It is the door of salvation. So we see the door of service and the door of salvation. But then in our text here, We see a door standing open in chapter 4, verse 1. And behold, a door was opened in heaven. The tense of that verb means that this door has been open, it continues to be open, and it will stay open, awaiting on the church to come in. And we know, by the Word of God, you and I know who the door is, right? In John chapter 10, verse number 9, Jesus said, I am the door. Amen? Listen to me, church. You're not going to get into heaven by the door of the church, by the door of membership, or by the door of good works, or merit, or anything else. You must come through the door that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way into heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. Amen? No other way. He is the door. He's the door to salvation. He's the door into heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, He's the one that died for you and I. He's the one that rose again for you and I. He's the one that paid the price for our sins. He is the door, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me move on. That's the first symbol we see in chapter 4, verse 1. The second one, the Bible goes on to say, And a door which was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So John says he heard a trumpet. Now understand this language is symbolism. You must understand that. So he's saying that, but what he's saying is, I didn't actually hear a trumpet. He's saying what I heard was a voice, and a voice that demanded uh, attention, a voice that was loud, a voice that was powerful and authoritative. I heard a voice that said this to me. He didn't hear a whisper. If someone come in here now or stood up anywhere and just blared a trumpet, You would hear it. It would get your attention. You would have notification. And they knew, they understood what trumpets were. And I think we covered this not too long ago, so I'm not going to go into detail. But trumpets were very important to the people uh, in the life of ancient Israel. And and they understood, and I'm not going to take time, but you can go back to the 10th chapter of the book of Numbers and God give Moses very uh, important instructions considering the trumpets in verses 1 through verse 10. 
Uh, The trumpets were used to gather people together. The trumpets were used to call people out. The trumpets were used to cause people to go to war. They did all this by the blare of how they blared, the number of blares, what they did on the trumpet. The entire nation of Israel knew how to respond. They knew what to say. In fact, the Bible tells you and I in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 14 and 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? You see, John's saying, I heard a voice. And what he's saying is, it was distinctive. And I got the message. I understood what it was saying. Because if we don't understand, then how can we prepare ourselves for the battles that lie ahead? If we don't understand. So, trumpets are used, and they're used heavily. And you could, you could go to the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I won't, well, maybe I will take time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16. The Bible said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You see, one of these days there's going to be a trumpet blast that will sound and the saints will leave this world forever. Amen? We're listening for that. Even so come Lord Jesus. Now John notes here that this trumpet was a voice. Trumpet was a voice. Now in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Aren't you glad of that? That God thinks enough of you that he's not going to send Gabriel. He's not going to send Michael. He's not going to send any of the cherubims or the seraphims. He's not going to send the apostles. He's not going to send uh, anyone else. We mean enough to him that he's going to come himself with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and he's going to call us home. That's how much he thinks of you and I. He's going to personally take care of that. Personally, I like that. Amen? Amen. Now, every time the Lord Jesus Christ, and I made mention of this Wednesday night, I told him as I was studying for this message, but every time in the New Testament the Lord Jesus Christ shouted, there was a resurrection. We find him in the book of John, chapter number 11, where he shouted at the tomb of Lazarus, and Lazarus came forth. If you remember then, he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't just say, come forth, or every grave would have burst open. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. We find him in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, that when he shouted on Calvary, it is finished. The Bible teaches us that many of the dead saints arose and walked the holy city. There was a resurrection. And the third time he'll shout will be at the rapture. And when he does, all the redeemed saints of God are going to hear his voice. And we're going to come from their graves. And we're going to go home to meet the Lord. Amen? There's power in Jesus. There's power in his voice. There's power in his name. Amen? Let me move on. One more point, one major point. We see the message of this verse. Number one, it speaks to deliverance. The Bible says here, John said, show you these things which must be hereafter. This is referring to future things. Listen, church, it's not going to be long. Until God comes back for the church, the world's plunged into this tribulation, and it'll be chapter 6 beyond in the book of the Revelation that will come upon this world. Things that are too uh, horrible to even understand. I wish I had the the terminology, the verbiage, the understanding, the vocabulary to explain exactly what is going to occur on this earth. It's going to be that heinous. But for the church, you and I, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that at all. We're going home in chapter 4, verse number 1. Now, I told you John is a representative man. Back in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible said, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I've said it, you've heard it before, that those in the graveyard are going to get a six-foot head start on us. And then we're going to meet them in the air. And we're going to go home to be with Jesus forever. Now, I understand the word rapture is not in the Bible. When it talks there, Paul uses those words in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. 
caught up. It means to be snatched away in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Listen, there's a lot of words. You can't decide that the rapture is not going to occur because that verbiage is not in the Word of God. There's a lot of words that may not be in the Bible. By raising your hands, how many in here today are a grandfather? I am. Do you know that the word grandfather is not in the Bible? We're still grandfathers, aren't we? Amen? Doesn't change the fact. And it doesn't change the fact because we choose the word, use the word rapture, which means a, a seizing away, a snatching away in a moment. It means to jerk something out of danger. If you were to go out here in the parking lot and someone was to be driving fast in the parking lot or out on the road and you saw a young baby and maybe in a, in a, in a <coughs> excuse me, in a, in a stroller or something being pushed into the road or walking in the road and you jumped and you grabbed that child and jerked it out of harm's way out of danger, that's what it means by being caught up. It means to seize or, or jerk one out of danger by force. That's the way we're leaving this world, amen. We won't have time to think about it. We won't have time to decide then if you want to accept the Lord. You won't have time to go back home or to tell somebody else where you're going. We'll be snatched away by force in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. One moment we're here, the next moment we're gone. Think about what that means for the world. This wasn't part of my message. But think about what that means for the world that's left behind. I drive a thousand miles a week. I spend several hours in the car. If I happen to be driving down I-77, or say I-40, I spend more time on 40 and 85. And if I'm going down through there and I'm in a 70 mile an hour zone, we won't talk about what I might be doing. But I'm in a 70 mile an hour zone. And God comes and snatches me out of this world. My car is not going with me. It's going to continue on until it crashes. What about the airline pilot that gets snatched out? The plane will continue on until it crashes. What about the train engineers? What about many other things? The, the ship's captains, all these things. All the world's going to keep turning. Now the Antichrist, and I'm not going to get into the Antichrist, but he'll step on the scene He'll have an explanation about all that. He'll talk about how bad we were and God judged us and took us out of this world that we've been lying to the whole world and God judged us and, and killed us all. He'll come up with it. He'll explain it away. But I'm not worried about what he does because I'll be up there. I'll be in heaven. Amen? He's going to do his thing, but I'll be doing mine. What am I going to be doing? Read chapter 4, chapter 5. You'll find us where the 4 and 20 elders are at the feet of Jesus worshiping him. Amen? Let me get back. That wasn't even part of my message. So he jerks us out. So <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, there are some people that would say the tribulation or the, the tribulation or the, the raptures occurred, uh, happened then or this, that we're in part of the tribulation now. Uh, there are those that would teach you uh, that part of the, that the church has to go part way through the tribulation, halfway through, 42 months, three and a half years, halfway through the seven years. And then there are those that would teach you the church must go all the way through the tribulation so that the church can be purified and cleansed and ready to present to Jesus. First of all, that's not what the Bible teaches. Second of all, I'm going to ask you a question. You remember this question. You ask it of anybody that ever tells you that. You listen to me carefully. What do you think the tribulation period could possibly do for the church of the living God that the blood of Jesus has not already done? Amen? Now you think about that for a moment. What do you think that the tribulation period could do for the church of God that the blood of Jesus has not already done? We have been cleansed, we have been purified. Uh, my soul is perfect and sinless and holy and it's going to go home to be with Jesus. Yes, there's sin in the church, there's problems in the church, but the soul has been saved and sealed by the Holy Ghost of God and it'll be presented perfect before God. We don't have to go through the tribulation period. Not at all. In fact, I'm going to give you a few reasons why, why I know that to be true. Number one, the Bible teaches us that we're saved and delivered from wrath. Not saved and delivered to go into wrath, but saved from wrath. Not only that, the Bible teaches us that we're looking for the blessed hope, not for the horrors and troubles of the great tribulation. 
We're looking for the blessed hope, not the wrath of God, not the Antichrist, none of those things. And then the examples we have in the the types in the Word of God, uh, they also suggest that the church will be taken out of the world before the rapture. What do you mean? Well, Enoch was removed before the flood. Enoch was a type of the church. The Bible tells us that Lot was removed before Sodom was destroyed. God always removes his people before the wrath falls. If you've been saved by the grace of God, we'll leave here in chapter 4, verse number 1, at the end of the church age. I'm almost through. Bear with me. Not only that, but it speaks of a destination here. It said, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In chapter uh, in First Thessalonians four seventeen, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here it says, "Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter." A door was opened in heaven, so we're going to pass from this world to heaven through an open door, the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? I want you to take just a moment. Imagine what that's going to be like when we leave this world. And the next thing we know, we are in the presence of a holy God in heaven. We're going to leave the devil's domain where he is the God of this world. And we're going to go to heaven. And we're going to see all the Old Testament saints as well as the New Testament saints all there together. Can you imagine waking up in that place or or coming to that place? Not waking up, that's the wrong word. But coming to that place where where the martyrs of all the ages are, where the great preachers of the past are, where the faithful church members that you knew and, and, and before, they're all there gathered together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine going to a city where there is no sin, there is no death, there is no heartache? Can you imagine going to a city where the streets paved with gold, what we count so precious here, And we'll walk on it there, street of gold. I can imagine that, and I don't believe it'll be too long. We won't have to imagine it. We'll experience it, amen? I do believe the next thing on God's timetable is the rapture of the church. So in closing, there's some exciting days ahead for the church of God. Be faithful, church. Be true to the church. Be true to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because one of these days, and one of these days soon, we're out of here. So the only question to remain would be, are you ready? Are you ready? John was called up to heaven. And one day every saved child of God will be called to heaven. So you will not have time to make up your mind then. The question today is, will you be in that number? Let's all stand just for a moment. All heads bowed, all eyes closed, just for a moment. I'm not going to lengthen the service. But I want to give you opportunity. I don't know your heart. I want to give you opportunity. If you've never been saved, if you don't know heaven is your home, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if that trumpet plays today, is blown today, if that voice shouts today, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would go in the rapture, I would encourage you to come to this altar and do business with the Holy God. It could occur at any moment. At any moment. Sister Sandra is going to play for us here in a moment. And while she does, I want you to consider that. Are you going to be sitting here in church and the rapture occur and you look around and many of the pews are empty and you're left sitting here and then you remember this message that day. Would you be honest with yourself? I don't know your hearts. Is there one? While we wait just a moment, would you be honest? Would you allow me the privilege of taking the Word of God and showing you what it means to be saved? He's coming back for the church, and I'm excited about that. I'm ready to leave this world. I have nothing that I need to go home for. Nothing. I'm ready to go home today. Father God, we thank you for the blessed hope that you're coming again for your church. Lord, we're thankful that you've not forgotten us. You didn't save us to forget us, Lord. You saved us to serve you, to tell others about salvation, to work for you, Lord. And then one day, you're coming back. Lord, over the years, we've planted many great saints in the graveyard of this church and many others. 
And Lord, you're going to come back one day and those graves are going to give way. We're going to receive a new body, a body without pain, without heartache, without sorrow. We're going to go home to be with you forever. Lord, it is my prayer by the testimony now of everyone here today that we've all been saved by the grace of God. It is my prayer that that's true. If it is not, Lord, you know our hearts. I pray that you'd send strong conviction that they'd come to a place that accept you as Lord and Savior. Or come and allow me the privilege to take the word of God and show them what it says about salvation. I'm thankful we have a hope, Lord, that lies beyond this grave. Paul said, if in this life only we have hope, we have all men most miserable. We have a greater day that lies ahead. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen.